If you're getting ready to celebrate St. Patrick's Day, then there's probably one image you just can't get out of your head. It's ubiquitous, it's something everyone sees and immediately thinks Ireland, it's the leprechaun. But what if I told you that the concept of this beloved magical gent is actually much more American than Irish? Here are a few basic facts behind the leprechaun. If you think leprechaun, the first visual you're going to get is of a small man in a bright green outfit with buckle shoes, a top hat, a fancy vest, maybe a pipe, and of course you can't forget that bright ginger beard. You see this character all over, parades, at pubs, in the movies, on social media, and in just about every kind of advertising. Yes, including cereal. Magically delicious. So how did we get here? Let's look at the original myths about leprechauns. There isn't much, to be honest. Most of the tradition is really unwritten. As a type of magical character, the leprechaun is closely related to other elves and fairy folk found in much of Europe. These include the dwarves of Scandinavia, who live in the earth, house and farm spirits such as the Scandinavian Tomten, the English Brownie, and the German Kobold. These guys would hang around your home or farm, sometimes helping out if you treated them nicely, sometimes playing tricks or wrecking things if you didn't. You know the story about the shoemaker and the elves? Well, that's more or less these guys. Other relatives closer to home include the fairy folk, or fey, of the Celtic lands. These beings occupy realms in the darker places humans don't feel comfortable in, such as deep forests or under the earth, and their realms seem to be set apart from ours by magic and a different flow of time. A lot of this is hopefully starting to sound familiar to you. So where does the leprechaun fit in specifically? Well, the first written story we have that seems to involve them comes from the 8th century. It's an episode in the adventures of the Irish hero Fergus MacLeity, a semi-legendary king of Ulster. At one point in his story, Fergus has fallen asleep by the shore. He awakens with a start to discover he has been dragged down the beach into the ocean by a gang of little water sprites who seem intent on drowning him. In the story, these are called Lucherpoan, which translates roughly to little bodies. Fergus escapes the sprites' bonds just in time and turns the tables on them. Scooping them up, he threatens to crush them. The sprites, in turn, beg for their lives and promise to give Fergus three wishes if he will let them go. Now, it's a pretty common theme in Celtic stories to have magical beings trying to drown you. Kelpies come to mind. And being granted wishes by an elf in exchange for their liberty is also a classic trope. That fits well with later leprechaun lore. The drowning, not so much. Aside from this tale, there's another story dating to around 1517, where a leprechaun king gifts King Fergus with a pair of magic shoes that allow him to walk underwater. So little people were clearly always there, an ancient fixture of the landscape just like other magical beings. From the stories we can glean a few common facts. One, they often make their living as cobblers. Many tales, like the one I mentioned, seem to involve the making of shoes, the classic elves in the shoemaker story. Next, they tend to live underground, or more correctly, inside the earth, like literally inside rocks. The entrances to their homes are often under a notable rock or the roots of an ancient tree. This calls to mind the fey folk we mentioned earlier, as well as some pretty obvious connotations about death and the underworld. Next, we know they love gold. Fables imply that the leprechauns collect treasures found in tombs and burial mounds, which makes perfect sense if they live in the earth already. There's also an implication that the leprechauns, like other fae, are very long lived, so odds are they knew a few of the people whose treasures they now keep. Incidentally, it was common for people to use old crockery and pots to hide wealth underground in times of danger, you know, like when the Vikings are coming. So there's your pot of gold connection. And as you know, one of the places the leprechaun treasure is hidden is at the end of the rainbow. This is a typical magical trope in folklore. Magical places and objects are often formed from things we humans can't really grasp or understand in our reality. The fairy world is basically the realm of metaphor. Finally, we all know leprechauns wear green! Wait, no, they don't. Well, at least not originally. Folklore describes the little men as wearing red and black. They are always fancily dressed though, that's never really changed. They definitely got it going on. That being so, where did the green come from? Well, in point of fact, the green thing is our best jumping off point for where the leprechaun enters American history and culture. 
And if you're going to talk about American leprechauns, you really need to talk about the color green, Irish nationalism, and St. Patrick's Day parades. Green is usually thought to represent the verdant, rolling countryside of Ireland. You know, the Emerald Isle. And this is certainly both true and beautiful. But the color association was originally purely political. In the Great Irish Rebellion of 1641, green was adopted as the basis of a flag for those who stood against the authority of the English crown. This was the green harp flag of Owen Roe O'Neill. It was a rallying point, a sharp contrast to the blue flag of the English-backed Kingdom of Ireland. Green has been a cultural touchstone ever since. By the 19th century, it was a regular feature in both political and cultural art. This became increasingly important to those who left the Emerald Isle. In the wake of the Great Irish Famines of 1845 to 1849, huge numbers of Irish immigrants found refuge in the United States. But they also found another flavor of hardship, including prejudice and discrimination. The memory of the famine lingered. Meanwhile, continuing struggles in Ireland, combined with xenophobia in the United States, gave rise to a new Irish-American culture and sense of self. Irish identity and Irish nationalism merged, and communities in the major cities such as New York and Boston found their footing and their voice. And yeah, Green was definitely in. One of the main vehicles for this evolution was the ritual of the St. Patrick's Day Parade. The first observance of St. Patrick's Day in America was organized by the Charitable Irish Society of Boston way back in 1737. But in the mid-19th century, these events really came into their own, partly through the efforts of groups like the Fenian Brotherhood and the Irish Republican Brotherhood, which were dedicated to the establishment of an independent Irish Republic. The parades, with all their rich symbolism and motifs, were about pride and heritage. They were also the best chance to present a positive public face to the American public, with a goal of full acceptance. And this is where the leprechaun becomes something altogether new, and why he wears green. You see, the one thing St. Patrick's Day parades lacked, as did the Irish diaspora as a whole, was a mascot. It's not certain who caught on to the idea first, but at some point in the late 19th to early 20th century, leprechauns started to become a thing in American pop culture. It was in keeping with the times. Characters like Uncle Sam and John Bull had been around for ages. And more so, sweet, friendly fairies were a huge pop culture trope for the Victorians. Just look at the children's books of the time. They're full of fairies and brownies. The turn of the century was the age of Peter Pan. So let me show you basically how Irish American thinkers and artists turned this to their advantage. Here, we see the old, really ugly stereotype of an Irishman as you might have seen in a 19th century newspaper. The costume is based on fashions worn in Ireland and really pretty much everywhere else in the early 19th century. A bucket hat or top hat, buckle brogues, cutaway coat and waistcoat, and knee breeches. For whatever reason, this uniform became the Irish caricature, possibly because some refugees of the famine were still wearing similar outfits in the 1840s or just as likely, bigoted cartoonists were trying to show the Irish as backward by dressing them in old-fashioned clothing. Sadly, these caricatures were common from the 1850s onward. They went right along with the No Irish Need Apply ads. It's hard to imagine a harsher image of xenophobia. At the time, a large percentage of Americans feared Irish taking jobs, causing crime, and giving the Catholic Church some sort of political influence. But okay, Look at this typical leprechaun image. See that? They basically took the stereotype and stood it on its head. The angry, stupid-looking bumpkin is now a jolly, rosy-cheeked ginger with a huge grin and a clever wink. Prior to this, leprechauns were usually drawn wearing medieval clothing, more like their English and German elf cousins. The idea, simple as it was, seems to have been to turn the stereotype into a friendly face. It basically says, Irish people are smart, clever, fun-loving, energetic, and hard-working. They're people you don't have to be afraid of. And in fact, they're people you would be happy to hire and work with. And you know what? It's stuck. The American idea of the crafty, cheery leprechaun was further fleshed out by a book, Darby O'Gill and the Good People by Hermione Templeton Cavanaugh. Published in 1903, the book is a loose children's novel. 
each chapter a short adventure in itself. The protagonist is a Tipperary man named Darby O'Gill, who encounters a wide variety of the fairy folk of Ireland, including leprechauns. Hitting at the peak of the fairy craze in the UK and America, the book was a smash hit. If this sounds familiar, of course it's because of the 1959 Disney film Darby O'Gill and the Little People. Walt Disney had visited Ireland and had become inspired to turn Kavanaugh's writings into a movie. Flawed and full of stereotypes? Oh yes. Nowadays it looks really cheesy, but this visual presentation of Irish folklore nevertheless cemented our modern idea of the leprechaun. You're looking at Brian of Nocticiga, king of all the leprechauns. So what about now? Clearly the modern leprechaun has become a huge part of Irish American culture and, dare I say it, heritage. And it seems to carry an impact for just about everyone. Lots of people, both Irish American and not, absolutely love leprechauns. On the other hand, a lot of people really, really hate leprechauns. Or more to the point, maybe, they hate what's been done to them over the years. While the leprechaun was originally a useful and clever way to turn a malicious stereotype into a positive mascot, many people feel it has sort of come full circle and become as bad a stereotype as any. In popular culture, the leprechaun has gone from being a cute greeting card image, to a cheesy costume, a corporate trademark, a code word for being crass, and of course this. I've got a lot of killing to make up for. <laughs> and this. So, is the leprechaun now offensive? or watered down as a cultural icon to the point of being completely trivial? Is our folk hero in green now forever linked to cliches about drunkenness or the so-called plastic patty phenomenon? Or are all of these expressions of, um, leprechaun attitude a way for us to poke fun at ourselves? I mean, it's a good thing to not take yourself too seriously, right? I'll be the first to admit I kinda like the idea of a creepy elf taking revenge on greedy jerks. It's hard to say. I mean, you've got this going on. But at the same time, you've got the National Leprechaun Museum in Dublin. That's right, you can go spend a whole day learning about Irish folklore or pretending you are leprechaun-sized. And no, it's not just American tourists who pay to go inside. Our emerald-clad gold hoarder has become an international sensation. He's even popular back home where his ancient cousins might not even recognize him. But you know, the more I think about it, the more I think the Leprechaun Museum has it right. Modern leprechauns came into their own through children's literature and folk tales. While the rest of us may get distracted by the weird or the irreverent, the biggest fans of original, uncut leprechaun lore are still kids. So maybe we need to try to see these magical gents more through their eyes. And maybe we should keep a few stories about how leprechauns came to America handy. Something to tell the kids when they're a wee bit older and starting to wonder about where they came from? Everyone has roots, even leprechauns. And the more you study and know your roots, the more proud and grateful you become. The more magical your heritage can be. Just something to think about this St. Patrick's Day. So what do you think? Is the leprechaun a cute ambassador of Irish and Irish-American culture? Or is he a hackneyed stereotype that you wish would just go away? Let us know in the comments. 